Greetings, everybody. I'm Julie Wiskirken from the author's team at Google Santa Monica. And today I'm very excited to welcome Mark Frauenfelder. Uh, Mark is the co-founder of the most popular blog in the world, boingboing.net, with more than 5 million unique visitors a month. He's also the editor-in-chief of Make Magazine, the leading publication of the do-it-yourself movement. He was formerly an editor at Wired, has appeared on the Martha Stewart Show and the Colbert Report, and has written for the New York Times Magazine, Popular Science, The Hollywood Reporter, CNN, and Business 2.0. And today, Mark's going to be talking to us about his book, Made by Hand, Searching for Meaning in a Throwaway World. So please join me in welcoming Mark Frauenfelder. Hey, everybody. Thanks a lot for having me. Um, I just received in the mail uh, a box of uh, the latest uh, issue of Make Magazine, hot off the presses. And so uh, I think I have about uh, 10 copies, so feel free to uh, take one after the talk. If uh, I'm, I'm sorry I don't have enough for everybody, but uh, that's all that they sent me. Um, it's a pretty cool issue. It's a talk. We have a big special section on the Arduino, which is a, uh, an easy-to-use microcontroller that you can incorporate into projects to give them all sorts of cool functionality. And then another thing that uh, you're free to grab is a little card that gives you information about Maker Faire. It's an event that we hold in San Mateo, New York, and Detroit every uh, year. And uh, we have about, uh, like at the San Mateo one, 85,000 people come. It's like, kind of like an engineering fair. Uh, people who, who create things, uh, you know, in their basements and garages and backyards and, and come show it off and give workshops and things like that. It's really a lot of fun. So I'll, I'll set these out when I'm done. I have a lot of uh, material to go over, so I'm going to go through these slides pretty quickly. I think I have about 45 minutes and about 15 minutes for questions. Is that right? Um, so uh, I wrote a book called Made by Hand. Everybody has a copy about it. And it was kind of my... Uh, 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 the reason I did it was because I was the editor-in-chief of Make Magazine, and I was into do-it-yourself, but more do-it-yourself media. I started Boing Boing when it was a, as a zine in 1988, and I was into uh, you know, uh, producing music and, and self-publishing books and things like that, but I never really used my hands to make physical things that much, even though I was kind of surrounded by engineers growing up and stuff. Um, but I became so inspired by going to Maker Faire and seeing what these makers were doing and stuff that I decided to kind of get involved in it and see what uh, the experience of becoming a maker was like and, and how it, it might uh, change my life. And so uh, uh, I decided what I wanted to really focus on was what, what's kind of known as modern homesteading or urban homesteading. And it's the idea of kind of producing your own food and, and uh, um, making kind of the things that you use every day. And in, in a way, it's a, it's a way to start simply, uh, and it's a way to get a lot of bang for the buck. Because if you make things that you use every day, you get a, a bigger return on your investment, as opposed to you know, making a, a really cool robot or something, which I think is a, is a really fun pursuit. But the impact it has on your daily life might not be as big as you know, actually carving your own uh, cooking utensils out of wood, because you would use those every day. So I, I kind of set out with a couple of goals. Um, to improve my family's home life by taking an active role in the things that feed, clothe, educate, maintain, and entertain us. And to gain a, a deeper connection and sense of engagement with the things and systems that keep us alive and happy. And so I decided to start out by doing some research, and I wanted to visit people who were already practicing kind of the urban homesteading uh, lifestyle. Uh, Eric and Kelly were the first people I, I visited. They live in Silver Lake, and they have a small house and a small yard, uh, yet they are able to produce quite a few of the calories that they uh, consume every day. They wrote a book that I highly recommend called The Urban Homestead. It's a great book that really helps you get started in, in learning how to do things like gardening and beekeeping and raising chickens, um, preserving food. Uh, they also have a really great blog called Homegrown Evolution where they continue to explore uh, urban homesteading. So when I, I visited, they, they have things like raised bed gardens uh, uh, scattered around their, their backyard. They, uh, those, those raised beds are, are watered using embedded drip systems that are programmable so that the water is delivered underneath the mulch 
in the raised bed garden. So you don't need to water as much. You don't have to worry about evaporation. Um, and you can also, uh, you don't have to be there every single day to water. You, you know, if you need to go out of town for a while, your, your system is, is taken care of. So there's the, the uh, drip system underneath the mulch. They also made these self-watering containers out of plastic bins. Uh, that's what they look like inside. And you just fill water into a reservoir below, and then the water wicks up through the soil um, and then keeps the, uh, keeps the stuff, uh, uh, you know, keeps your, your vegetable soil wet uh, or moist enough. And, and that really helps because here in, in the kind of Mediterranean climate we have in Southern California, if you have potted plants, you have to water them once a day in the summer, if not more than once a day. They also built this little thing called a rocket stove that lets them use the twigs that just fall around uh, their yard to cook things. So they'll cook breakfast using this little rocket stove. Um, and it's a cool thing because you don't have to like harvest, uh, you know, big pieces of wood to use it. You can just use twigs and it's, it's very efficient and uh, it remarkably doesn't make much smoke or anything and it gets hot really fast. They experiment with solar cooking um, and uh, they've, you know, tried several designs. You can go see all the different kinds of designs at solarcooking.org. Um, in one of the issues of Make Magazine, this guy uh, did a great project for us using a solar cooker like this. It's mounted on a turntable that has a solar cell and a motor. And so what happens is when the sun hits the solar panel, the motor slowly turns until the solar cooker casts a shadow over the solar cell. So then it stops. And then when the solar cooker is out of the path again, uh, you know, it's not getting a lot of sunlight, the sun hits the, the solar panel again and it rotates. So it's always facing the sun. It's like a, a really great, uh, you know, stupid feedback system, but, uh, you know, behaves in a smart way. I love that kind of thing. Um, here's a food dehydrator they made so that uh, cooler air travels up that inclined plane there uh, and it gets warmer and warmer and moves faster and faster and then it goes into this little kind of house thing uh, where uh, there's a lot of screens laid out horizontally and then you can put your sliced uh, fruit or vegetables or whatever it is you want to dry and uh, it's just, you know, constant stream of warm air going up there and, uh, and uh, drying your food quickly and, you know, it, it can be like after a day then you have nice dried food that it's a great way to preserve food as opposed to canning which uh, is kind of a scary thing to do because of uh, you know, you have to worry about botulism and things like that if the acidity content isn't high. Uh, they've also made good use of the parkways uh, to grow vegetables. They call this their illegal parkway garden, um, and they grow, uh, grow squash there, even though you're not really supposed to use parkways for that. Um, uh, they, they went ahead and did, and they've had no trouble doing that so far. So uh, I, these different people, I, I try to learn from them and take tips that I, I could use for myself. So here, here are their uh, principles of successful urban farming. Grow only useful things, you know, vegetables, uh, herbs that could be used for, for medicine, things like that. Uh, really pay attention to your region and where you live. Don't try to grow things that won't grow well here. Um, build your soil. That means, you know, compost, uh, 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 vermiculture, using worms, uh, composting. Uh, water deeply and less frequently. That embedded drip system helps with that. Uh, work makes work. Uh, so th th that's an idea. Don't try to fight your environment. Try to work with it. If you're, if you're constantly doing things to try to make things happen, it just kind of accretes more work around that to, to get what you need done. Um, so, you know, example, let your chickens just run around and they'll eat the bugs and they'll fertilize uh, the area for you at the same time. Um, Failure is part of the game. That, that was something that was really important to me in the book that I write about a lot is not to get discouraged. You know, you see things like, uh, you know, Home and Garden TV have all these people who do things perfectly. Martha Stewart, it's discouraging to see that because you can never measure up to that. And, and, and they can't measure up to it either. You know, they, they have millions of failures until they show you what really works. And so in a way, it, it, it's encouraging to learn from other people's mistakes and to learn from your own mistakes and to share your mistakes. You, you learn a lot from, from making mistakes, actually. And pay attention and keep notes, which is what I tried to do when I met these folks. Uh, the Energy Garden. Julian and Celine live in, uh, well, they, they live in London now, but they, when they were living in Sebastopol, they're the founders of the Post Carbon Institute. 
uh, it was this uh, organization that was founded on the idea that we are going to run out of liquid fuels in the coming decades. And so we need to figure out ways to relocalize everything uh, so that we aren't dependent on this free, cheap energy, you know, our very cheap energy that we've had that, that has propelled us through the Industrial Revolution. So they created basically a big experimental garden uh, in their house, and I think their house was about a third of an acre of land. Um, so they had self-watering containers that would kind of distribute water uh, to different uh, uh, pots around the, around the place. It was kind of an interesting system. This is a, just a look at, at what their backyard looks like. They grew a huge variety of different things. All, all you know, lots of different beans and seeds and legumes, maize, uh, uh, grains they grew. They wanted to try their own wheat, root vegetables. Uh, and they got an incredible amount of produce for just a small piece of property. And here are their chickens that are running around. They, they put everything into an equation to see how much uh, return they would get in terms of how many calories they would get out of something, uh, you know, the ratio of how many calories they would get out over how many calories they had to put in. So chickens, you give them, uh, you know, uh, uh, 50 calories a day of, of, of uh, food that, uh, you know, people really can't eat, but they would produce, or no, you give them 100 calories, they'll produce 50 calories of, of useful energy. So that's a pretty good efficiency, 50% efficient. Um, just a couple of looks. Uh, they actually had so much produce that they started this thing called the U-Pick system where they would take the, uh, let people come to their property and just pick whatever they wanted from the neighborhood and then the, the people would weigh it or you know, pay by the bunch and just put money in a little box on the front porch. And uh, uh, it, it was a way to you know, kind of connect the community together and you know, sell the, their excess produce because they had more than they needed. They experimented a lot with tools because, you know, their idea is in the post-carbon world, we're going to have to go back to using, you know, animal power or human power or, uh, you know, uh, solar power, different ways of, of non-liquid fuel energy. And so they were experimenting with things like making cider presses. You can see they have these kind of drywall screw, screws in, in the piece of, uh, you know, this round piece of wood and you turn it and it'll tear the apples up. Um, they experimented with this kind of helical windmill. You, you can see Julian looks kind of discouraged. Uh, you, you know, they, they learned that one thing they learned is really hard to, to go back to these kinds of methods of uh, producing food and growing crops by using hand tools. Um, we, we've become so dependent on, on liquid fuel. It's like this wonderful, precious resource. And... Uh, we haven't always lived like that. You know, it's just been a very tiny period of time where people have been able to have this free ride. And so they think, you know, the time is now to try to come up with ways that really work. Um, you know, there, there's the concern of being injured using these tools. Julian said it's really easy to throw out your back, uh, tilling soil and things like that with these kind of scary looking tools they've come up with. Uh, another problem that they have to deal with and that we deal with here too is gophers. Um, they, that, that spike there, that kind of scary looking spike, uh, battery power, you put it in the ground and it emits like a, a shrill uh, buzz every couple of minutes. But uh, the problem with that was it wasn't waterproof and so it would stop working after a couple of weeks and the, the gophers got into the melons and the plastic bag that Julian had holding up there had instructions for uh, the, uh, the embedded drip system and the gophers actually got in there because they wanted to, I guess they wanted to taste the, the user manual or something. Um, and so, so they thought, well, what about making our own liquid fuel? Maybe that would be something we could do by, by squeezing canola seeds. So they had this, this hand press to try to do it, but you just can't, it's really hard to extract. If you, here's, here's what canola seeds look like. They're really tiny and really hard. And so, you know, people think that, uh, you know, th these kind of biofuels are an easy solution. They're, they're really incredibly difficult uh, and might not be a way to do it if uh, you're looking for a localized solution. One thing they did have pretty good luck with was pressing sorghum and extracting uh, 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 sugar 
from sorghum and, then, and converting that into ethanol. Um, so they, they did an experiment. Uh, they had uh, you know, about 250 pounds of sorghum. They ended up getting 10 gallons of juice. Uh, and so basically, uh, th from their equations, one acre of sorghum equals 20 gallons of, of pure ethanol, which means, you know, fuel is, is really precious. We, we've been getting it so cheaply now. To, an acre for 20, for 20 gallons of, of, of uh, alcohol, that's not even as, uh, not nearly as much energy as gasoline. And they tried making stills for energy. Um, so what I learned from them is uh, try lots of little things. Experiment a lot before you find out what works for you. Um, uh, one gallon of gasoline equals five weeks of hard human labor. You shouldn't hate liquid fuel. You, sh you should treat it as something precious. Uh, life in a post-carbon world isn't going to be easy. And go for suck. <laughs> so the third uh, group that I visited was back in here in LA. Uh, uh, Eric and Julia, they run a a uh, blog called Ramshackle Solid, and they kind of take their Ramshackle Solid philosophy uh, to heart where, where they live in, in L.A. It's kind of on the border between Pasadena and L.A. Their blog is excellent. These are all the subjects of the different things that they, they explore. Uh, this is just a look at some of their property. Um, Eric got a mulcher at a garage sale, so he's just basically been grinding up everything into mulch all over the place. They have this little tent they built that they practically live in year round. They take all their meals there and you can lift up the, the sides depending on, on the weather conditions. Little place to hang out. These are bean poles made out of rebar. Uh, this is a shack that, uh, I shared pictures of the shack uh, from West Virginia that an architect designed. I shared these with Eric and he said this would be great for me to build a, a little shack on my property. So he took a look at th this and built something similar to it on his property. And uh, this is what it looks like inside. It's really nice. And, and so I, I thought this was interesting, his, his justification for making it. At first we thought about renting a studio, but at a cost of at least $500 a month here in LA, that didn't make sense. We were able to build this shack style studio for about half the annual cost of renting plus about 10 full days of labor spread over two months for me and a friend. It's a great place to hang out. And they really like to reuse things. So here's his uh, desk is just like a, a piece of wood that he found and just nailed it to the wall. Uh, they like to do things like, uh, uh, you know, as much as possible with the materials they can find at hand, make things that they need. So these, this is what he calls a compostable child safety lock. And I guess the idea is to kind of tie it up so it's too complicated for the kid to figure out how to, to open it. But it's so, it's so much more delightful to see that than something like that that you would buy in a, in a store. So what I learned from them, keep it simple. Small victories add up. If you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. And uh, th that was, uh, it was a great antidote to go visit Eric and Julie after Celine and Julian, who are, are really nice people, but they're kind of negative peak oil viewpoint was a little bit of a, a bummer. And these guys uh, had a really good, happy attitude about it. So uh, back at my, so after you know, doing this research for a while, I went back to my house. Uh, this was when we lived in Tarzan. And I thought, I will kill my, my lawn and cover it with mulch and then uh, use it to, uh, you know, as, as an orchard and a garden. So uh, I took a one day class on lawn killing from a, a, uh, the Theodore Payne Foundation and uh, ordered some mulch. And that's what 15 cubic yards of mulch looks like. And uh, after it, here it was in front of our house. And uh, I left it there for a couple of days. And people started pilfering from it. So I had to bring it into the, the house. Um, so that's what the lawn looked like before. And first sprinkled the, the grass with gypsum to uh, kind of accelerate the process. And then, and then you take. Uh, what you also do is you soak the lawn really well because what you want to do is smother the lawn and, and have all the seeds germinate, the weeds and the grass seeds and everything, and then, and then pour vinegar on it to help uh, kill everything and then cover it all up with cardboard. And so that those seeds that do end up germinating that weren't killed by the vinegar will, will germinate, but they won't get any sunlight and they'll die. So we covered, we had been saving cardboard boxes and newspapers for 
a long time and we just covered everything up and then spread a layer of mulch on top of it and then that was the finished result. So then the next step is, is growing food. Um, and so I started with these little seed starters and I, I, you know, I, an example of me not knowing what I'm doing, I put them under fluorescent lights but there wasn't enough light and so the plants were starved for, uh, for, sun, for, you know, for light and so they, they grew these really long spindly stems to try to get as close to the light as possible. And the effect is that it's like a you know, garden hose that gets kinked, the, the things just fall over and, and die. And you have these light-starved plants that tried their best to reach the source of illumination but just couldn't make it. Um, one thing that I have not done but I would love to try out is this guy, Mikey Sklar, who's a May contributor and he lives in Truth or Consequences, New Mexico, uh, and is a great experimenter, has these little LED seed starters that uh, are very low voltage, uh, consume low power, and they're mostly red with a little bit of blue. Uh, and, and what he found is that, uh, you know, uh, it's more efficient if you, if you feed your plants just a certain spectrum of light. And uh, here's an example of some plants that he's grown using his one watt uh, LED seed starter. And you can see they're a lot more robust than the ones that I had. Nevertheless, we took the ones that, that didn't die. Here's my daughter, and we, we planted them in the garden. And, uh, you know, radishes, uh, I, I actually just planted those directly from seed in the garden. But we started getting, you know, a decent amount of produce, and it was really fun. Every week we would take a picture of, of what we harvested. Um, and then we decided, you know, a way to keep it, because you get a whole bunch in the summer, and you can't eat it all, so you want to kind of stretch it as far into the fall and winter as you can. So we tried drying the food. Um, and uh, uh, this is a little side trip that I wanted to tell you about. In 2003, my family and I moved to an island in the South Pacific called Rarotonga. And uh, we, our, our plan was to stay there for a year. And uh, we were only there for five months. But I won't get into that. Um, we had coconuts that were growing in our yard. And it was, uh, they would fall out of the tree and hit the, hit the ground. And, and I wanted to get, you know, the, the coconut juice and the, the, uh, the pulp out of it. And I wasn't really sure what to do. So I was trying rocks or bashing with a hammer or something. And the, uh, uh, our landlady said, well, you need a coconut scraping bench to do that. And uh, to, to extract the, the, the meat out of the coconut. And I said, well, how do you, you know, how do you get one? She said, well, you have to go to the junkyard and get a, uh, a leaf spring from a car and then you can take it to this guy who will, who will forge it and serrate the ends and you can take that to a carpenter and he will build it into a little, you know, mount it onto a bench. Or you can just borrow mine. And I said, all right, well, I'll borrow yours. That sounds like a good deal. So, uh, so uh, I also learned how to like husk the outer shell of the coconut and crack it with a machete and everything. And so we started like processing all these coconuts and it was really a lot of fun to do that uh, you know, every day and we started, you know, making coconut pancakes, coconut scones, just coconut cream for the fish we bought and uh, that kind of, uh, th that's in a way uh, got me really interested in, in this kind of lifestyle, just slowing down and appreciating, you know, having a more active role in your, in your food was, was doing this coconut stuff. And so when we came back, we wanted to kind of do that a little bit more uh, in, uh, you know, in, in Los Angeles. And so I, I started really getting into to, you know, drying tomatoes and peppers and, uh, and figs. And this was a, a way that I, I learned to dry uh, persimmons, like a, it's a Japanese way. You cut the stem so it's like a little T-shape and tie a string and then just hang them from a tree. And when they dry, they're really good. We had this, this fig tree in Tarzana, I mean a persimmon tree. And uh, the persimmons, I couldn't stand them because when, when they're when they're hard, they just have a horrible like alum, they, like your mouth puckers, that you, they're inedible. Or you can let them get soft like a custard, but it's kind of goopy. And so what you do is you just wait until they're bright red and then peel the skin off and let them dry. And then it's, it's really great. Some, somehow some transformation occurs and they're very sweet. It's like candy. I also started uh, making sauerkraut. Um, and uh, it's, it's ridiculously simple. Uh, is, there's a re the recipe isn't even really a recipe. The only ingredients uh, are cabbage and salt, nothing else. You just chop the cabbage up, sprinkle salt into it, 
um, and then you put it into a crock and cover it up and uh, weigh it down because it's an anaerobic process. You, don't, you want the, the cabbage to be under the surface of the liquid uh, to do its thing. And then you get this great tasting fermented probiotic sauerkraut that costs a fraction of what you would pay for raw sauerkraut at Whole Foods. It's ridiculously cheap and very simple to make. And in fact, I, I started using this thing called a Picklemeister that uses a little uh, air trap to keep uh, mold from getting into it. And it's even easier and quicker with this thing. And um, you know, if you buy cabbage like at a farmer's market for a dollar a head or so, you can make cabbage uh, for you know, like 50 cents for a quart or less as opposed to you know, like $7 a quart at Whole Foods. And the amount of effort you put into it is, is almost nothing. And the same with yogurt. I've been started making yogurt. And uh, once you start making it, you never want to go back to getting the store-bought stuff. You just take a little bit of yogurt from your last batch and put it into the new batch you're making. And uh, it's automatic. You know, the only ingredient with yogurt is milk. You don't need anything else. Uh, we started uh, raising chickens, too, which was really a lot of fun. It was one of the highlights of, of this whole experience for me. I actually ordered chickens uh, uh, mail order from a place called mypetchicken.com and they sent us uh, they sent us six little uh, Plymouth Bard Rock chicks and then this was an old like weird kind of shed that was in my backyard that we had been using to store junk and I thought this would, it used before we lived there it was a rabbit hutch the, the previous owner had used it for rabbits I think or a couple of previous owners ago and it had fallen into pretty bad disrepair that's what it looked like inside so I went to work at it and bought materials and it was, you know, the roof was falling apart and somebody had put this piece of wood to try to patch it together. So I just slowly attacked it and uh, used uh, part of a torn down fence to uh, uh, replace that, that wire that was below the chicken wire and just slowly got to it and finally had this pretty nice looking place for the chickens to live. And here, by the time I was done, the chickens had been living in a big box. They, they were ready to, to move in. And uh, my, my kids couldn't tell the difference between the chickens. They looked pretty identical. So we had these little colored tie straps. And so we put them around the chickens' feet so we could tell the difference be between which chicken was which. And it really helped. Then, we, you, know, then you could I'd start identifying the personality differences between the chickens. And then we had this little color-coded guide that we uh, tacked to the inside of the coop to tell which chicken was which. And so here are the benefits of keeping chickens. They're great fertilizer. Um, this is, uh, can you guys see that? Okay, it looks kind of dark. Um, uh, uh, it, the, the chickens live in a coop over wire, and so they poop onto burlap bags that my friend Terry lays underneath the coop. And when they get really like filled with chicken manure, she takes those and wraps the burlap bag around the citrus trees uh, that are growing in pots on her deck. And then you just water them and you know, the poop just goes into the soil in the pot. And it's a great way to fertilize the, uh, the citrus trees. They love it. And the chickens are great at getting rid of pests. We let our chickens just run around in our house in Tarzana because it was all fenced off. And they took care of, we had tons of black widows. One day I found nine black widows on our property. And uh, my wife, when that she found out about that, she called you know some guy to come every couple of months to spray. And was, you know, here's this guy spraying when we have kids running around. And so when we got the chickens, we canceled the spray and thought, well, we'll just have to live with the black widows. But I don't want the chickens eating grass that has you know been sprayed with bug killer. But the chickens actually ate all the black widows and all the bugs. I never saw bugs anymore. It was great. Uh, and they're really good at, at recycling output. So if we had, you know, I think this is a, a pieces of pancake or waffle, any kind of food you could throw out there and they would just devour it. Um, once we had like, this is kind of gross, but we had like a big turkey leg and nobody wanted it anymore. So I threw it into the, the thing and I came back two hours later and it was such a clean looking bone. It was like a cartoon bone or something. I mean, they just completely picked it. They're very efficient at it. They love projects like that. Um, and then the eggs, you know, are like the, the obvious benefit that uh, you don't think about. And it was funny, our neighbor kids, when, when the eggs first started coming out, my kids, my friends, my, my kids' friends would come over and say, wow, these are, these are eggs. I mean, 
uh, what do you do with them? And we're like, well, we eat them. You can eat these eggs? Because they just were completely surprised. And they're great entertainment. They were just really kind of clownish and funny, yet dignified at the same time. I, I really like them. Here's a little video of a, the first couple of eggs that a chicken lays. Sometimes they don't have a shell. They just have that kind of, you know. And so I, I just shot a video because it was so weird. It was really freaky, those first few eggs that they lay. They're just kind of like the first pancake in a batch is bad, I guess. Um, so uh, another thing I wanted to do was kind of make my own music. And, and by doing that, not just like play music, but to actually make the instruments too. And so uh, this was a piece of an old kitchen table that I took and I uh, bought some hardware and I decided to start out by using uh, uh, matchsticks for frets. And uh, at first I was gonna use a Tinker Toy to hold the, ampli the, uh, the pickup. And I tuned this little thing kind of like a hammer dulcimer and it had a pretty good sound. Um, and then I wanted to move on to, use, to making like a genuine cigar box guitar. These have been around for over 100 years and Howlin' Wolf got started on one and Jimi Hendrix got started on a cigar box guitar. And I bought fret wire. I was always afraid I, frets would be so hard to install but they're really easy actually because of the, the, see there's the cross section of the fret. You just tap them in into the little slots that you cut. File them down. I used uh, you know, a pencil for the bridge and uh, there's a cabinet hinge to uh, hold the strings. And uh, they're really fun to make. I, I make a lot of them and I give them away as, as gifts. I can you know, make a simple one now in a, in a few hours. And this little cigar box ukulele that I made and a slide out of a bottle, it's, it's got a nice sound. And I started making amplifiers for them too uh, using an LM386 uh, chip, it's a little, op-amp op chip that costs about a dollar and then you just put like a couple of capacitors and a resistor on it. You have a pretty good sounding amp. Uh, here at Maker Faire I found a guy who made a cigar box violin. This guy, this was like he said he tore a piece off of a, of a bar in San Francisco and made some kind of a weird instrument out of it with his own pickup that he designed and wound. Here's a one string kind of instrument, un, unnameable instrument. Uh, there's a great place online called Cigar Box Nation where all the cigar box guitar making aficionados go to share the different designs and plans they have for cigars, cigar boxes. Um, here's an example of a one string. I'm a sad one of the Okay, here's two strings. Hey, it's Shane. Here's the new Chugger two string cigar box guitar. Each one signed and dated. Here we go. And here's three strings. All right, so you get the idea that, you know, simple instruments, uh, a diddly bow like that one string instrument you can make in probably 15 minutes. Um, and that two string chugger, you could, uh, you know, there's no frets on it or anything, you could make it in 45 minutes. But they have a cool sound, you know, it's a unique sound. And uh, so that, that's been one of my favorite things is making instruments like that. Uh, another thing I wanted to do was uh, uh, add a uh, temperature control to my espresso maker. This is a uh, Ranchilio Silvia espresso maker. They cost about $500 to $600. They're really great espresso machines. The weak, the Achilles heel of them 
is that they use the bimetallic thermostat. That's just an on-off thermostat. And so uh, you can have a temperature swing of like 40 degrees Fahrenheit when you make, when you pull a shot of espresso. And that's like a completely unacceptable. Um, you really should lock it down a lot tighter than that. And so people have come up with these things called temperature surfing where they, you know, wait till the light goes off, they pour some water, they listen for the hiss to stop, that means it stop boiling, you continue to let the water pour out for a while, and you, you know, pack, put the coffee on. And, but uh, the other way is that you can use a PID temperature controller on it, uh, proportional integral derivative temperature controller that uh, uh, does a lot, is a much, much more sophisticated way of controlling it. And uh, people are, are uh, actually now selling kits that you can uh, attach. And they come with a relay to turn the boiler off and on. So I took my espresso maker apart, at, uh, you know, took the uh, connectors off the bimetallic thermostat. And uh, that's what it looks like now, that, that unit there on the uh, left is the, con is the temperature controller and you can use little push buttons to set the exact temperature you want the water to be. And uh, that's actually the outside of the boiler. The water temperature is lower than that. That, that would not be good coffee if we were like that. Um, and so anyway, it's much better coffee. I've, I've locked that down. The temperature variation is like under one degree now uh, as opposed to 40 degrees. And then another thing I wanted to do was make a, a bottomless portafilter. So this was, and w the reason you want to do that is you can like see the coffee coming out better and you can judge if, you're, if you've done it, everything right, like use the right kind of grind, uh, pack the coffee properly. And so I just kind of dremeled it to bits and polished it off and that's what it looks like now. And here's what it, I, here's what it looks like. Uh, using a bottomless portafilter. You can see lots of pictures like this at espressoporn.blogspot.com. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, how am I doing for time? Do I have a few more minutes? Okay, okay, uh, I'll go really quickly. Backwards beekeeping, there's a club here in Los Angeles that does a natural beekeeping uh, method where there's no chemicals whatsoever. And uh, they kind of follow this beekeeper from Santa Cruz who uh, was an interesting fellow. I have established mystic contact with the spiritual core of apiculture. Now anything is possible. Um, this is a little light fixture that was about this big. And all of our lights up on our second floor of my house were dark. And so I unscrewed one and it was filled with dead bees, every single one of them. And so uh, the bee club, the, the leader of the bee club, and I got the bees out and put them into my uh, hive. And so they were taken out. Uh, that's what we typically do is we rescue bees. People call and say, you know, I, I have a bee invasion and we'll take those bees and give them to people who want to uh, put them into hives. People decorate their hives. I'll skip that video. Um, this is the only place in Los Angeles that remains that you can buy uh, honeybee supplies. Los Angeles Honey Company. There used to be tons because, you know, the valley was in lots of orchards and stuff. But all of LA, it's so weird, there's just one bee place. And that, those are some of my frames that are loaded with honey that I harvested this summer. That's what the honeycomb looks like. You crush it up. This is one way of doing it. Some, some people do a centrifugal extractor, but, but we just crushed it up and then uh, built kind of a filtering system out of these plastic buckets and then the honey drips out. And then you get this really great honey that it, it's very tasty, and you also get wax too. And I make things, you know, lip balm or candles. Uh, whittling, I really got into making this uh, this branch that fell off a tree. I started making spoons and different implements out of it. Carved, carved them. Uh, okay, I'm almost at the end. So kids are, if you have kids, this kind of life, kids love it. They have so much fun making things. My daughter did some embroidery. So we had lots of projects. Uh, you know, even collecting sea glasses, a kind of a making act, DIY activity, making their own bread. So uh, uh, this is kind of what I, I learned at the end, homesteading happiness in three steps. Make more of your own stuff. I made a pillow there. These are just examples of things that we made around the house. Make your living and workspaces as personal as possible. These are the people that I visited while I wrote the book and just asked to take pictures of their, 
their workspaces. That guy's a magician, a magic prop maker in LA. And then follow Bruce Sterling's Guide to Better Living. Bruce Sterling's a science fiction writer and a kind of a futurist. And here's Bruce Sterling's guide. Divide your current possessions into four major categories. Beautiful things, emotionally important things, tools, devices, and appliances that efficiently perform a useful function. Everything else. Enjoy using the things in one through three. Get rid of everything in category four. And that's it. Thanks a lot. Do, do we have any time for questions? If yeah, you, if we've got time for questions. questions. If you guys, we just okay. wait for the microphone to come to you. Raise your hand. It, it seems like uh, like doing all of these things. It looks like a lot of fun, but it would be like a lot of time. And I imagine it sounds like your job. You know, like this. You know, writing and things like that is a big. You know, it gives you an opportunity to explore this. How, how feasible do you think doing this sort of thing is for people who work a normal forty to fifty, sixty hour work week? <laughs> uh, you know, and I mean to be able to come home and do these things. I, I, I like how you said. You know, it's like a lot of it is for fun, and you mm -hmm. know. How, how consuming of a hobby is it, or would it be? Yeah, it can be very time consuming. And you know, there are times when I'm really busy too, where I don't have time to, to really get into something. But you know, really everybody has 15 minutes a day. And it, you could probably carve out even more if you are really dedicated. So you know, making sauerkraut, you could, you could do the whole thing and get it all ready to store away for a month to do this fermentation thing. It might take you, you know, a half an hour. Making yogurt doesn't take long. Um, sometimes, like, I, when I have a conference call, a lot of times I will just uh, put on the, uh, the phones to do the call and just whittle a spoon while I'm on the, on the call because it's kind of like knitting where you can have a conversation and, and it doesn't interfere with your knitting or with your conversation. And for a lot of people, I think, especially people like me who are probably slightly ADD-ish, having something to do with my hands while I talk it helps me concentrate, actually. So I think, you know, even gardening, there are people who have this kind of 15-minute-a-day rule where they only garden for 15 minutes, but they always garden at least 15 minutes every single day. And then they don't have to do anything more than that. And it's a good way to just get out and do that. And it takes, that, that 15 minutes is pretty valuable and memorable compared to the flow of your work throughout the rest of the day. Pretty beneficial, I think. And the correlation to that, uh, what about space? Because it seems like some of these projects that you've uh, talked about require a lot of space, and some of us you know, live in apartments or condos yeah. that don't have yards. Yeah. What advice could you provide um, there? Uh, you know, just being creative and making do. Like there are members of the B Club who don't have uh, don't th that live in apartments, and and so uh, <laughs> um, they they come up with ways to do it. Uh, putting it on the roof of the apartment if the landlord says it's okay. Um, some people in Brooklyn keep bees on their balcony. Um, uh, so there are ways to do it. You know, or, or if you want a garden, you could do an herb garden. You know, on your on your windowsill. Uh, and there are lots of different work. You know, if you, if you have tools and things, you can have just a tiny desk and have a small workspace for smaller projects. Um, you know, it just depends. You, you, you know, that's again kind of don't fight your environment thing. Don't try to do things that don't work with what you, you your environment and your situation or else, you know, what is the point of doing it? So uh, can you uh, tell us about some of your most interesting failures? Um, let's see. Uh, well, the, the the chickens ended up being a failure. It, I don't know how interesting it was, but you know, the, the the problem was when we lived in Tarzana, the chickens had a great time. They, it was fenced off. We didn't, never had to worry about predators or anything. And then when we moved to Studio City, uh, it was fenced off. But the, we we're kind of up in the hills, and the predator situation is really bad. And they, the coyotes, uh, and uh, I write about this in the book. Coyotes and bobcats 
uh, and raccoons and skunks just started picking off the chickens one by one. And I, I kept on trying to do different things, you know, better enclosures, this, that, but they were just, you know, if you build a fence and cover it up, they will dig under, you know. It's like they, the predators, the, the chickens are like, you know, Big Macs on two legs running around, and that's just very tempting. And so that was, that was a failure uh, for sure. Um, and uh, let's see what, uh, you know, other thing, like one thing once when I was making a cigar box guitar, I, I accidentally cut a fret in the wrong spot, and I thought I'm going to have to throw away this whole neck that I've made. But instead I just like ground, I had some sawdust and glue and filled in the, 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 the cut, the misplaced slot, and it still looked bad, so then I thought, well, I'll just paint the whole thing a color, and I painted it like green, and then it ended up being like a cool thing, and now I typically paint all my necks a color, kind of as my thing, you know, that's like my thing is I have colored necks, and if I hadn't had, had failed in that way, I probably never would have painted the necks that way. So, some, you know, sometimes they lead to places you wouldn't have, have taken yourself intentionally in a good way. So I, I, that dovetails in with the other question I had, which mm -hmm. is... Uh, when you're building a cigar uh, box guitar, mm -hmm. how the hell do you brace the neck on there so you're not just like ripping the, the box and uh, you know apart when you put the tension? Oh put yeah, the tension on from the strings. So. Um, what I do is I just open the lid of the cigar. So here, here's the box and here's the lid. I open the lid and then I just lay the stick on it, uh, and uh, and then close it and and. Uh, and then, let's see, I mean... I see, the neck goes all the way through it. Yeah, the neck oh, goes okay. all the way through. Okay. Yeah, and then I just drill. I, I, I don't use glue when I put them together. I use screws. I try to use as little glue as possible on anything because then you can take it apart if it breaks and you don't have to wait for the glue to dry. So, yeah, there's not a problem with that. But I see what you mean, yeah. Otherwise, you would have a problem. It goes all the way through. And it's thinner there, though, because you want more resonance. So you make it as, you oh, know, as, as a game. Like the part that's hidden inside the box, you want as, I, I think, you know as thin as possible because you don't want to deaden uh, the vibrations. Yeah, I wanted to know more about um, raising chickens. My mm -hmm. sister-in-law raises chickens and always mentions to me when we scrape plates, like, oh, you wouldn't have to throw this away if you had chickens. <laughs> but I want to know, like, time and resources and what, what does it take to have chickens besides no coyotes? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> well, if you don't have to worry about predators, they actually aren't that hard to, to deal with. Um, you know, you just make sure that they're fed and watered and have access to, uh, you know, sunshine and be able to get out. But they very, they're very hardy animals. And people, you know, in the Midwest can keep them, when the temperatures drop really low, they don't even need to turn the heat on in the coop. They're very uh, uh, robust animals. And so they don't need a lot of care. I mean, they're much easier than I, I would say a dog. Maybe, you know, they, they might be like a cat or less than a cat. They do their own thing. And do, just a quick follow-up. Did you have some kind of shelter or shed for them even in Cal down here? Yeah, yeah. Um, when we moved from Tarzan, I built a, a coop for them that was on stilts with a little uh, ramp for them to go into. Um, and then... Uh, when the coyotes started coming, I built a fence so they, it would lead into a little pen that they could walk around in. But, you know, I, I, it just didn't feel good having them trapped like that, having the animals penned in. I would really, if you keep chickens, I would, they're going to be a lot happier. And you are, too, if you just let them run around your yard. Um, and when we were in Tarzana, they would occasionally get out and go into the street, but they always know how to come back. As soon as the sun, sun starts coming down, like little soldiers, they all go on a little line and go into the coop. They're, it's fun to watch. So for a lot of these projects, there's like a varying level of you know, time and space and energy commitment. When you were talking to the, the first few groups that you, uh, that you interviewed, did they give any indication of kind of when the return really starts to happen, like the going from buying the pre-assembled thing to buying the tools or the materials or, you know, going through the failures and the, the learning processes, like when they started really feeling value? Um, yeah, I mean, I think most people felt value, you know, in, in different levels at different times, but it was pretty immediate, you know. 
making a, a composter, uh, there's just, you know, just the fact that you made it is good and, and makes you feel like you've accomplished something. And then once real compost is being formed, you know, and steam's rising off of it in the early morning, that's another level. Or with like the bees, successfully getting them out of the attic and into the hive was, was really satisfying. And then, uh, you know, getting honey was like an incredible thing. So there's different levels of reward throughout the process, I would say. There's not like one big payoff, it, 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 there, it, you know, which is good in a way, because it, it, it keeps you going. Those small victories, you know, add up, which is what the ramshackle solid people like to say. Does anyone over VC have a question? No. Any more local questions? I wondered, uh, with the bees, you mentioned them, how, uh, how kind of, I don't know, kind of, did you get stung and were they kind of like a pain in the neck or were you able to keep them far enough away? What did you do to yeah. kind of worry about that? Uh, that? You know, that was something my wife was really concerned about is, oh, the bees are going to be stinging us and bothering us all the time. But, uh, you know, luckily we have pretty good sized piece of property. It's long and narrow, so we put it way off on the far end. And they have not really, bo they haven't bothered us. I've, believe it or not, I've only been stung once. It was when my, my mask, the mesh of it was against my cheek, and one stung me on the cheek. But luckily, I don't, stings don't really bother me that much. So, you know, I was just able to carry on. Um, they don't. Once I, I was working with them and I forgot to smoke them, you know, if you put, if you have a little smoker and it kind of makes them drowsy, um, I forgot to do the smoker and they started like getting agitated, you know, because you're tearing apart their house. So of course they're going to be agitated. We'd all get mad too. Um, and, and so then, uh, but I didn't get stung. They're just swarming all over the place. But uh, it wasn't really that much of a, a problem. I, I, now that I smoke them all the time, they're just, they, they aren't a problem. And they're, they're like, chickens are easy, even bees are incredibly easy. You know, I go check once every couple of weeks to see if the bees are still there. I mean, you know, the idea is just to let the bees be bees. Um, this part of the year is probably where I do quite a bit compared to other parts is where, because uh, there's not a lot of blossoms for the bees to get food. So I put uh, baggies of sugar water in there just to kind of supplement and keep them going. I don't want them to abscond from the hive. So that's like the, the most treatment the bees get. And then the summer's a little active of the harvesting. But the rest of the year, you just let them do their thing. So uh, do you have a problem with neighbors with this kind of stuff, like with bees and chickens and, I don't know, drilling late at night and that yeah. kind of stuff, you know, whatever you're... Yeah, uh, well, we, we made sure not to get roosters. Roosters would be a problem, you know, because roosters, if you've ever been around, that it's a myth that they crow at sun up and sundown. They crow all day long and all night long, too. <laughs> it just never stops. Yeah, and they're aggressive. Yeah, they are. And so, uh, and the, no, but no complaints from anybody. I mean, people were delighted about the chickens. And the bees, I have not advertised the fact that I have bees. And nobody's, <laughs> <laughs> nobody said anything, because we don't even notice the bees, you know, in, in our house. So nobody notices them. And, and so, it, yeah, we only have it, not one neighbor that's, that's near the bees, and they're never there, and that's so, it works out. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, thanks very much, Mark. Yeah, thank you, Julie. Thanks, everybody.